Daniel DiMartino Booth is with us. Wall Street Journal's Global Economics Editor John Hilsenrath and Hatley Heath Manning, Director of Policy for the Independent Women's Forum. Folks, uh, just to recap real quick what Jennifer said, I thought it was interesting. It just seems how much perhaps the Fed was paying attention to market volatility, how much that may be playing a role in the decision making process. And also, I'll start with you, uh, Danielle. What prior Fed actions have already done to this economy? I think that's the question, because when, when Chairman Powell was in Dallas, your neck of the woods, he actually told the Q&A section, he admitted they're not sure what their policy decisions are doing to this economy 18 to 24 months out. There's no instrument out there that will tell them just what no. the impact will be. I thought that was a huge revelation. It was, um, and these minutes are extremely, extremely dovish in my view. Uh, and they definitely spoke to what central bankers, what we all learned Day one at the, at the central bank, you learn the word lag. You know that, that monetary tightening and loosening don't hit the economy for nine to 24 months going forward, and that is exactly what Chair Powell was speaking to in Dallas. Um, but again, I, I was really surprised at these minutes, Charles. Uh, J John, it's being patient uh, and, and the idea that perhaps these minutes reflect a more dovish Jay Powell than the one we saw on display. Does that mean maybe he was sending a message more to the White House than, than maybe about Fed policy? No, I don't think I don't think he was speaking to to the White House. I think what's going on with the Fed is they started a shift in the weeks leading up to this meeting. They started to see that maybe the economy is going to slow next year, that inflation hasn't materialized as much as they thought it might, that markets were getting wobbly and they wanted to signal that they might pause interest rate increases. They kind of sent hints about that. Uh, at, at the meeting and these minutes reflect that and then since then when the markets just completely fell out of bed they realized they had to dial up that that argument and so they did last week uh, and I think we're going to see more of that when the Fed chairman speaks later this week I think what they see is an economy that grew really fast this year didn't produce inflation and markets are now signaling worries so they're they're trying to say to the market, yes, we get it, and we might pause on these rate increases you know, in 2019. Hadley, one of the other criticisms was, you know, the Fed, their role, you know, okay, you have a dual mandate, uh, inflation or, you know, prices and, and employment. If everything feels like it's okay right now, wage growth is a little bit more than it had been, but it was long overdue. Is it their mandate to stop or slow an economy that's not necessarily threatening inflation in the first place? Right. And any decision that the Fed makes is, you know, un unfortunately, it's going to have some political overtones. They have to uh, ultimately take sides. their savers and there's borrowers and they're Im impacted differently by what the Fed decides to do. Um, but when the Fed looks at our economy, I mean, there's a big picture. There's a lot of data when you look at. For example, the past three jobs reports show on average we've been adding 250,000 jobs per month. This is a very strong labor market. That's one aspect of our economy that, you know, gives us reason to be optimistic about growth and about, you know, the fundamentals of our economy being strong. The Fed can't ignore that data, um, although President Trump would be happy if the, if the Fed does decide to be less aggressive and take a pause on some of these rate hikes, as it seems like they may well, do. Well, Danielle, does the Fed then, do they work off their old models and assumptions? In other words, some people are saying the dynamics have changed the inflation threats of the 70s uh the, you know they're, they're not there they may not come around for a long time we live in an amazon world we live right. in, a in a world with deflationary pressures not to add to, you know how much oil has come down and things like that but in general a deflationary sort of economy maybe it's the internet that's changed everything is the fed changing their modeling at all you know, it, it, it sounds as if they are based on what we've heard and seen since the Fed met on December the 14th. Um, it, 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 would, it looks like they're sort of abandoning what you're referring to, which is the Phillips curve, which is that, that tight relationship that used to prevail in the 70s and the 80s that really does seem to have fallen apart in the current era. That so I higher agree job growth automatically met more wa higher wages automatically to. met a threat or inflationary yes. pressure. Right. When we were young, it did. <laughs> Uh, John, you mentioned that Jay Powell. Hey, hey, Charles, Ch Ch can yeah. I say one other thing Please about do. that? Uh, um, you know, one of the really interesting things about Jerome Powell is that he's not an economist. And one of the things that he, I think, brings to the Fed is 
skepticism about some of these traditional economic models. So it's interesting. You asked about you mentioned the White House earlier. You know, the, the, the president wants the Fed to take a different course, not to raise interest rates as aggressively. Jerome Powell is actually kind of sympathetic to what the president is talking about. He's not on autopilot. He is willing to say, all right, you know, inflation isn't showing up, even though unemployment is. I'm willing to change course. So even though even though the president has been so critical of Powell, Powell is actually doing things, I think, more in line with what the president wants than, you know, some Ph.D. economists might otherwise do. Hatley, uh, we have four Fed uh, officials speak out or give interviews a day. Powell, five more tomorrow, nine, uh, eight or nine in the next 24 hours or whatever. And I guess the problem for a lot of market watchers, Jay Bullard, we are at a good level right now. We don't need to rush and push him higher. Bostic, who's not a voting member, maybe one more rate hike, we'll see. Charles Evans, we need three more rate hikes. Now, he didn't give us a date, but that sent the market down a little bit. And finally, Eric Rosengren, uh, we'll take a wait and see approach. This, this, this sort of chorus uh, of different opinions and different ideas, the market's having a tough time grappling with this. Uh, it's, are we hearing too much from too many Fed officials? Yeah, I think it seems so. I mean, it's understandable why Fed officials want to speak out and why the media wants to cover it and why market watchers want to pay attention to their every word. Um, but I think ultimately markets, the minutes, the votes, tell us much more. And when we hear from the Fed chairman later this week, that'll tell us a little bit more information. But every comment from every official isn't something that should send the market into a frenzy. But let's let's be honest, you know, the stock market's a very psychological uh, entity. And there's, you know, every day to day, the, the news, whether it's a government shutdown, U.S.-China relations, the things that we're hearing about, you know, our economic picture at home and abroad, these things do impact the market. Right. And so Fed officials ought to be careful with their words, ultimately. Danielle, do you agree with John in a sense that, not that Jay Powell is playing ball with the White House, but may mm -hmm. actually be sympathetic and, and understand and actually ha have be more aligned with President Trump's line of thinking than we might have thought because of the tweets and things like that. Well, they've both been in the business world before, right? I mean, he, Jay Powell founded the Industrials Group when he was at, at the Carlisle. He speaks to CEOs. He paid attention, for example, to the Fed. Uh, FedEx uh, profit warning. He's going to pay attention to the upcoming earnings season. He sees that there are disconnects between the hard economic data and what companies so are broadcasting. So why did the dot plot say two more rate hikes? Why, why was that the message sent in? You know, because the, that scared the hell out of the market. It, it did, but by the same token, Powell keeps, Powell does not like the dot plot. And Powell kept trying to say, this is simply 17 individuals' inputs. You can't gather too much from it. I mean, look, Charlie Evans is the biggest dove we know of, and he said three rate hikes today. It's like, it's like these Fed officials are having like and existential yet you still public are modeling, breakdowns. You're still modeling for recession. You're looking at we're in a cusp, perhaps, of a recession. As well. Oh, absolutely. Everything that we Right. seen shows that outside of the unemployment rate, which is the most lagging of economic indicators, the job market turned in August. John, well, what, what changes the Fed here? It uh, feels like they turned on a dime, at least from the outside view looking in. What changes their mind and gets us back to two, three, four rate hikes? Uh, I think two things. What, one is, most importantly, if they start to see those inflation numbers pick up. That is their mandate to keep inflation around 2%. It's there now. If it goes way over it, then the Fed has to respond to it. You know, I think the other thing is the job market. We had a gangbuster job market uh, at, at the end of this year. And I think if they see the economy continuing to create jobs at a really um, aggressive pace and that unemployment rate continuing to come down, then they might feel a little bit more comfortable about continuing to raise right. interest rates, too. So, Dan Danielle, that would be a modified Phillips, right? Exactly. <laughs> Danielle, John, <laughs> Hadley, thank you all very much. Great stuff. Appreciate it.